Welcome everyone. Um, today we are diving into Housing First and research. So it's a, a continuation of our Housing First Europe hub um, webinars, but it's the first time we're really tackling a, a research question. And we've invited uh, Tim Aubry from the University of Ottawa, um, Aurélie Talente, I'm just checking, from um, Ex, uh, Université Aix-en-Provence and uh, working in Marseille, uh, and Freik Svenuain, Director of Fairness. Um, and today the idea is that we talk about some recent papers on Housing First that have come out and to give us all the opportunity to speak directly to the researchers themselves, um, ask some uh, questions and give ourselves an opportunity to, to exchange on these topics because we don't have an opportunity to, to see each other in person at the moment. So for which we are all a little bit sad, obviously. So um, I will, the format is that we'll give uh, Tim and Aurélie 20 minutes each to make their presentations. Um, and then we like to open it up to questions, um, discussion, et cetera. And then I will ask Freik to do some concluding remarks and ask any burning questions that he hasn't had a chance to ask yet. Um, and, and then we'll wrap it up. Usually these webinars tend to be about an hour, but since this is two, this present, these will have two very good presentations, I know, uh, and probably provoke a lot of questions and discussions. We, we sort of scheduled it to go a bit beyond an hour. So you can count on sort of an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes. So um, in terms of the etiquette of, uh, of the, the meeting, now that we're in this, webinar format, um, we can't hear you as participants. So you'll have to work hard to get our attention by typing a message into the chat or raising your hand. I think there's a raise hand function, so you can use that. Um, but please, yeah, use the chat to ask your questions. Feel free even to ask the questions in the chat while you're listening to the presentations and I will try and my best to, to keep track of them and, and pose them uh, as you know, when it comes to the question and answer. Um, and uh, I think um, without further ado, I will uh, hand over to, to Tim, who's a professor in the School of Psychology and a senior researcher at the Center for Research on Education and Community Services at the University of Ottawa and has been actively involved in Housing First and Housing First research for, for a couple of years now, dating back at least to, to the At Home Chez Soi uh, project, which Canada is very well known for. Um, so I'll hand over to Tim to, to get us started. Thanks a lot, Samara. It's, it's great being here. And thanks for putting together this, uh, this webinar. I'm going to give just a little context. This is uh, what I'm going to do is walk you through findings from a, a recent paper we published, which is a systematic review of effectiveness, cost effectiveness of, and I'm using the term permanent supportive housing, which is the term now that's being used in the literature. When you go beyond uh, housing first, although I will say, the majority of the research is, is on housing first. Uh, and then in this systematic review, we did some work on uh, uh, income support. There wasn't a huge number of studies and some of them didn't necessarily differentiate themselves really easily from, uh, from permanent supportive housing, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Just to give you the context, this review, uh, it was conducted as part of a, a larger project that was intended to develop clinical guidelines for primary care physicians uh, in Canada to help them uh, really work with people who are homeless, who, who, who've had the experience of homelessness, or who are teetering, you know, who are vulnerably housed. And it was a, quite a large project, and this was only one of, of several reviews uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today. So just, I, I mean, um, you know, I have, we have no uh, declaration here that I don't have any affiliation. There's no uh, money driving this, but we, we're very fortunate to get funding from a number of sources uh, in Canada um, that you can see here. And it's a very large team. I get the, the I guess, the pleasure to, uh, to talk about these findings, but uh, 
uh, when you do this kind of systematic review, it, it involves a lot of people um, just because of the, the amount of literature you have to go through and code it and uh, uh, rate it and so on. And you can see uh, the names, some of them you, you may recognize there uh, from people who do research uh, in the area of, of Housing First. So this was the, the steps. Uh, we kind of did a needs assessment initially through a, a Delphi survey across the country. Then we got together to come up with a research process, identify the systematic reviews we were going to do, and carry them out. Uh, and then there was a panel that came up uh, with these guidelines. There is a paper on the guidelines that summarizes all the systematic reviews uh, that came out in March this year uh, in, the, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And certainly uh, I can make that available to you. The project was led by Kevin Potty, uh, who's a primary care physician in Ottawa and who had done a very similar project uh, to develop clinical guidelines for, for primary care physicians to work with refugees. Uh, a number of years ago that were put in place and, and did have uh, a, a very good impact in getting primary care physicians to take on uh, refugees in their um, patient rosters. This is Terry Hannigan. He, we, we had a group of community scholars or who were people who had some lived experience and uh, there was some interest, of course. Uh, and I guess why I got involved in this project, I should say, is that the idea was to try to bring in to the whole effort uh, to get past homelessness and to get people back into communities and into housing and, you know, start getting the right services that they need, particularly in healthcare. that this was really a, an opportunity to get a group of people, primary care physicians on board in the effort in Canada to, uh, to end homelessness. I'm throwing in an ad here for a, an upcoming webinar um, that we're doing. It's actually going to cover uh, this, this larger project that this systematic review is part of. Uh, this is a, a community of interest that I co-chair with Jeff Nelson in Ontario. Um, and we do webinars. In fact, we're working on collaborating with, uh, with the Housing First, the Europe Hub uh, Housing First uh, group and with Tamara. Uh, and you can see, you'll recognize the names here with uh, uh, Stephen Wang's going to talk about his work. He's done extensive work on healthcare. And then Kevin will talk about the larger project that I mentioned. And then as well, um, there's some interesting work going on in Windsor. Uh, where uh, they've connected housing with public health at the municipal level. So let me walk you through the review. This is the evidence review team um, that was, that was uh, involved in this. Again, you might recognize some names. There's Vicki Sturgeopoulos, who's done some really important and impactful work on Housing First, in addition to uh, work, her work in community mental health. Uh, the paper is published in Lancet Public Health. Uh, it came out in June, uh, and it's open access. Um, and there's also a very extensive uh, uh, set of appendices um, that go through all the all of the studies that were reviewed. So really, very simply, we wanted to do this this systematic review. We want to look at effectiveness, cost effectiveness, as I said, permanent supportive housing and income support. Those were really what we were going to target. The, in terms of the research methods, we followed research methods that have become pretty normative now um, in systematic reviews that you see in uh, the Cochrane collaboration uh, or in um, the Campbell collaboration. You can see we went through all sorts of, um, you know, different uh, databases to get the studies. Uh, and I should mention, so we, we, we extended it. There's randomized controlled trials. Uh, there are what we call quasi-experimental studies. They had to have a comparison group uh, and be longitudinal. Uh, and then and cost-effectiveness studies. This will take us right to February uh, 2020. Uh, so this is very current. Um, and we followed this grading of, uh, of studies 
that has become quite, again, normative and popular uh, to look at uh, how good is the research uh, in this area. So you, you can see we went through a lot of records. In the end, um, there's about 15 studies on permanent supportive housing. Uh, it includes scattered site and single site. Um, it's important to mention that. Uh, 10 studies on income assistance, and then 21 on cost uh, and cost effectiveness to, in terms of publications. But I should mention there's only a few that do what's called comprehensive uh, use comprehensive costing methods where they try to cost everything. Um, and when I get to those findings, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit more about that. When it comes to the housing outcomes, um, we all know, and I'm sure everybody that's here today and, and that's, uh, you know, uh, taking in this webinar, that this is where the action is. Um, when we talk about permanent supportive housing, when we talk about housing first, uh, you can see, you know, in terms of a meta-analysis, you can see um, uh, the paper by uh, uh, Vicky uh, Sturgiopoulos and, and her team uh, of people that, that were involved in the at-home Chez study. There's actually a very large effect when we talk about number of days stably housed. The gap is, is very large. Uh, and when we talk about uh, effect size in this area when we do a meta-analysis, you know, once you get up to one and beyond, that's a, that's a, that's, is what I would call a huge effect. So what's happening here, we're comparing, uh, in this case, housing first in the Canadian study uh, to uh, treatment as usual, which is any other services that are available. And then we put together the study that I was involved in, again, with the team from the At Home Chez Soi group, uh, with work trial that was done in the States, part of the Pathways Housing First, looking at uh, the number of participants in stable housing at 24 months. And again, the, the effect size is, is very, very large. Um, when we talk about uh, participants, you know, there's, there's, uh, essentially, we, you know, we know that with Housing First, 75% to 90% uh, seem to be able to end homelessness, stay in their housing. Uh, we certainly know that at two years, but I'll, I'll show you the one six-year study in, in a minute. And you can see again that this is, this is a very large impact when you compare it to treatment as usual. This is, um, this is a study that came out recently. Um, uh, that Vicky Sturgiopoulos, Stephen Wang, and the group in Toronto, the Toronto site, they were able to actually follow the at-home Chez Soi participants in Toronto for six years. And you can see they split it up here into high-need participants, which is the, the upper graph, and um, moderate-need participants, which is the lower graph, and the red is housing first, and that's the percentage of time stably housed. So you can see with high the people with high level of needs, the gap remains. Housing First is outperforming in, in a huge manner. In fact, there's, there's literally doesn't seem to be any change. Down below, moderate needs, the, the gap isn't as wide, but it's still there. And you can see the stability in terms of people staying in their housing. Now, some of these people, would have been what we call graduate from housing first, and yet they're still housed. Um, I, and I think this is, uh, this is really good news. So that's another paper that, uh, that you can certainly access that's, um, uh, that's open, uh, open access. This is where it gets interesting, and, and I think it's become fairly widely known. And, and in this case, we did what are called narrative uh, syntheses because there really wasn't data across studies that we could uh, conduct a meta-analysis on. And you can see, realistically, if you compare uh, permanent supportive housing, including Housing First, uh, to uh, most social and health outcomes, you don't see any difference between uh, Housing First uh, and usual services. But I should say, you, we did see improvements 
And typically in studies, you will see improvements, but the improvements are the same, whether it's permanent supportive housing or usual services. Where there's some evidence of differences is quality of life. I put up the graph. This is, uh, this is all of the participants in the um, At Home Chez Soi project. It's from the national report. You can see the gap in terms of quality of life, but you can also see that people in usual services also had improvements. And then there was some evidence more in the US studies of reduced hospitalizations. And I think Orly's gonna, gonna talk about some of that because that's, a, I think, a primary outcome. And I, I won't steal her thunder on, on the French findings. I, I do wanna mention, despite the lack uh, of differences between uh, Housing First and TAU, there's an important study that was done as part of the At Home Chez Soi project that was led by Jeff Nelson. And it's a qualitative study. And uh, where people at 18 months, 200, there was about 100 in each group. They're a little more in housing first, I think, than treatment as usual. But they went through a very in-depth uh, interview that talked about life changes in 13 different domains. Uh, and then there was blind coding uh, of the life changes uh, for the two groups. Uh, and then there was a, in, in a rating whether it was uniformly positive, mixed, or negative. And you can see uh, there is a notable difference here, a significant difference uh, between people in the housing first and treatment as usual. Now, this is qualitative data, so it doesn't get captured uh, typically in systematic reviews. Um, but this is an important study, and I, I think we need to do uh, more work in this area uh, when we're working on um, uh, in housing first research. So uh, income assistance, there was a small number of studies, uh, certainly rent subsidies, when you, when you look at that, we do see again, uh, long-term improvements in housing stability outcomes. Those are critical, critical components, um, certainly critical components of housing first. But we did include in the systematic review the family option study, uh, which is a very large study that was done uh, in the US. Uh, Mary Beth Shin is, uh, is involved, uh, Jill Kadari. Uh, and they certainly found, you know, again, huge impacts on the housing side compared to other types of services, including something like uh, transitional housing. There's also indication uh, improvements, again, in quality of life. I think there's a study shows um, reduction in depression symptoms and stress levels. Uh, and then interestingly, but again, these are, these are one-off studies, uh, compensated work therapy, uh, a, pro a program known as individual placement and support uh, that I know is being implemented in Europe. It shows that it, it, it has, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the, the one study that was done, can reduce homelessness and um, cause or, or produce increased uh, housing stability. Now, the cost effectiveness, uh, you know, really, uh, and I mentioned that when you look at cost effectiveness studies in this area, there's only a small number that have done uh, what we call comprehensive costing, and that's where you cost uh, healthcare, obviously, which is you know can be a big, can be an expensive kind of resource for people to access. Social services, and then involvement in the justice correctional system. Now, bottom line on this is that you certainly see cost offsets, what we call cost offsets. So that what that means is that you know, you put money into permanent supportive housing, into housing first, uh, and you see reductions in service use. Now the cost offsets though, they don't, uh, what we, we have or what we know at this point, they don't cover the whole cost of the Housing First program. Now it's important to note that these are only uh, Canadian and American studies. Context is so important. And even within the At Home Chez Soi project in Toronto, uh, my recollection is that the cost offsets covered uh, for the um, uh, people with the highest level of needs covered all of uh, 
the cost of, of the Housing First program because of reduction in, in use of services. But then in, in Moncton, uh, the smallest uh, uh, town, there was very little cost offsets. So the context is so important because it, it, it obviously, it essentially contributes to what are you comparing your permanent supportive housing or housing first against in terms of um, uh, other services. And I'll just mention uh, we two, two studies that were done out of the at home. One of them is in our systematic review, but the second one literally just came out, uh, I believe in August, uh, that were led by Eric Latimer. You can see the cost, uh, uh, $56 for each additional day of stable housing. This is moderate uh, level of needs. Almost half uh, of the cost of Housing First and intensive case management is offset through a reduction of other services. And then um, for people with high level of needs, it's less, $42 for each additional day of stable housing. And here it's about 70% uh, level of, uh, of cost offset. Uh, and those are Canadian dollars, uh, incidentally. And again, those, those papers uh, are available if you're interested. Limitations, um, we've got lots of different uh, permanent supportive housing programs. A lot of them aren't described in great detail, so it's hard to know what the intervention is and how you would go about replicating it. And, and certainly that's, um, uh, that's an issue. Uh, usual care is context specific. So you'll hear from Maura Lee in a minute um, the usual care in France is very different from the usual care uh, in Canada. Um, at this point, we, we can only do a narrative synth synthesis of non-housing outcomes. There just isn't the data to do, you know, a, a quantitative meta-analysis. Um, our rating of the studies, incidentally, using the, the grade system was that uh, they talk about you know, level of certainty about the findings. So the, the, that's at low to moderate level of certainty. Um, um, the Housing First studies that are randomized controlled trials tend to be moderate. Uh, it means that, you know, we know, we, we know enough to, to, to want to recommend these kind of programs, but there may be other findings that we don't know about. Uh, and if, if some of the limitations of the research are addressed, um, some of the findings may be a little different, although I think you can take it to the bank that uh, uh, permanent supportive housing and housing first have huge impacts in terms of getting people uh, off the street uh, and ending their homelessness. Uh, Mention that we, the, the studies we had at that point were only uh, from uh, Canada and the US, and this is why it's going to be great to hear orally in a minute. Um, and then the, the, there's only that one study that the Vicky Sturgiopoulos and Stephen Wang were involved in out of Toronto um, that was six years. Otherwise, it tends to be two years or less. Uh, and we, we, we need more comprehensive costing studies, and, and particularly that are relevant to each context. Just where to go from here. Uh, people talk about Housing First Plus, permanent supportive housing, housing, because, okay, we get people out of, out of homelessness, which is great. It's so important. Um, they can start to rebuild their lives um, and start getting connected in the community. But it seems we're not seeing um, those uh, health and social outcomes that I think we, many of us expected. So we're gonna to have to enrich the community support. And, and there's, you know, there's a number of evidence-based interventions that can be brought into um, uh, these programs, whether it's strengths-based uh, case management, uh, mentioned IPS, individual placement and support, this uh, integrated dual diagnosis treatment, um, peer support. So we need to do that. Um, we also need to look at um, different types of support and different levels of intensity. I don't think we fully so have yeah. sorted out people with high level of needs versus moderate level of needs. And you know, ACT, which is the, 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 the richest and, and, and most intensive form of support and, and that has a really good evidence base, 
uh, is there. But just to give you an example, in Canada, uh, the majority of our, our Housing First programs use intensive case management. Um, I think we got to find out who has trouble in these programs. You know, is it, can we understand what are people's backgrounds, what are their characteristics when it doesn't work out? Um, and that's in both scattered site and single site. Um, I mentioned about the need for, for more cost, uh, cost benefit, cost effectiveness studies. Um, the single site programs are all over the map. Um, there's no uh, standards that I know about, a fidelity measure. Uh, in response to COVID in Canada right now, um, there's a huge push to buy up hotels, to take on abandoned buildings, to convert shelters. Those will be single site programs. So we really need, to, need some work in that area. Uh, and then this, getting back to this idea of outcomes, we need to include the, the, the uh, people's stories, people's using qualitative methods. Um, and, and as I said, it, that's an important study that, that Jeff Nelson did um, that shows there's, there's some really good things going on for people getting into housing that were not captured by our measures in the at-home uh, Swap project anyhow. So that's, uh, that's a walk through um, our systematic review and I know once we've heard from Orly, that there'll be a chance for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. That was a really, yeah, a great uh, walkthrough. I, I had read the paper already, but it's also, it's, yeah, it's, it's different to hear it <laughs> and, uh, and process it that way. So that's really great. And I have some great questions and I, I really appreciate your suggestions for future research at the end, because that keeps us all thinking, yeah, what can we do next and what more do we need to know? I, I thought that was very helpful. Um, maybe now, can we hand over to Aurélie? Are you, are you ready, Aurélie? So thank you very much uh, to invite me to present some results from uh, uh, Housing First uh, Initial Experimentation in France. I am already in land and I'm a psychiatrist. Perhaps you said it, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I couldn't hear you. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, and to speak after Tim Aubry. Um, Tim and uh, all the Canadian team was uh, helped us enormously. enormously. Uh, with the implementation uh, of Housing First in France. So thank you again uh, so much, Tim. Just a few words about the uh, French context, like uh, elsewhere in Europe, uh, except uh, in Finland, we see uh, the failure and the uh, undersizing of uh, usual homelessness policies and uh, increase of homelessness. And uh, the French system, I don't know if you know, uh, is characterized by a strong welfare system and uh, medical care in one side, in one side, and uh, social support, uh, very distinct words. Um, we have an uh, universal uh, financial assistance for housing, um, and in the field of psychiatry, recovery movement is barely emerging. Uh, it's a big difference. Uh, between North America uh, and, uh, and France and Europe, except the uh, UK. So everybody knows the usual the step-by-step step model and the housing source model and uh, the housing source principles based on the respect on the rights and choices of the individuals. In France, the housing source was uh, experimented and uh, called uh, un chez d'abord. Uh, housing source intervention was uh, uh, direct access to housing and uh, support by uh, an ICT team, ACT team, um, and there were peer workers on this team, and the housing first team were uh, recovery oriented and professionals were trained because there's no other recovery oriented team at the beginning of the, of the project. Housing first uh, in France took place in four cities. Uh, for the initial uh, experimentation, Lille, Paris, Marseille, and Toulouse. And there was a, a strong, uh, there's been a strong involvement of uh, government with the uh, Ministry of Health and Housing uh, uh, as an uh, investment and a national interministerial uh, steering uh, with Pascal Secondi in GI 
and the evaluation was conducted in the form of a clinical trial, like in Canada and in the United States. And the design was a prospective one, a comparative one, in the form uh, of a randomized control trial um, to avoid a maximum of bias and to target the highest possible level of evidence. The highest level of evidence uh, to influence policy. Um, the population is a bit different than uh, the, the, the population in uh, other, other countries because we have narrowed the focus on uh, homeless people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. This is specified uh, of the French, uh, French trial. Uh, we compared two groups, housing first. I think housing first, but as I said before, it's act one. Uh, with, uh, it's a temporary model, thanks to uh, housing first stability scale. So it's a specific form of housing first, but the, the first one. Uh, and the treatment as usual, where all other services, we are exceptions. And uh, the, the main criterion of uh, the French research was, was the healthcare use. And uh, we also wanted to evaluate uh, uh, the effect of housing first on housing stability, uh, physical and mental health, quality of life, and addiction. And interviewers met uh, with participants in both groups every six months for two years. Uh, we included 703 participants. They were randomized into two groups, uh, 253 in housing first group, 350 in uh, treatment as, as, as usual group. And uh, we succeeded to complete the last interview, uh, M24, for 71%, more in housing first group than in uh, treatment as usual group, where there was more uh, people lost to follow up. Um, 34 people died during uh, the two years. It's 5% uh, of the total uh, participants. Um, 23 known deaths in uh, as first group and uh, 11 known deaths in treatment as usual group. Uh, it could be an uh, information, information bias because we don't have any sign of life for around 30 people in a treatment as usual group and only uh, for two people in a housing first group. Um, we have also 14 people uh, that which were included in housing first group and uh, never actually to housing. Uh, they could refuse, change uh, of city, uh, go to the to detention or departure for senior home. Um, all the results of these uh, 14 people were, anal were analyzed in intention to treat with the results of uh, housing first group. Participants, uh, French participants, housing first participants were mostly male, uh, 82%, middle age, around 40, and uh, almost, almost, almost 70% had the diagnosis of schizophrenia, and almost 80% had the dual diagnosis, dual diagnosis uh, that is one diagnosis of abuse or dependence and one uh, diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And the, the average time, time spent living homeless was eight years, including four years in a it was one situation, sleeping in the street or public spaces. Uh, the groups were, were totally comparable, uh, so the randomization were after inclusion in the uh, housing first group, uh, several housing choices were offered to the participants, and uh, housing access was quite rapid, with a median 28 days after inclusion, in spite of uh, the difficulties of association in mobilizing, in mobilizing housing. Uh, during the time between inclusion and housing, people were sheltered in hostel. Uh, results about housing, uh, because uh, it was not, not our main criterion, but uh, for housing, for housing first, uh, but I think it's uh, the, 
the most important. In housing first group, we can see that uh, people access housing in the first six months and uh, that they stay in their homes. It's the blue, um, the blue part of the graphic, the turquoise blue. Um, and this part of uh, housing, this very huge effect, like in the uh, in, uh, in team uh, review, uh, reduces the space for hospital, for, for the streets, and uh, for shelters. Um, for hospital, it's the gray, the gray color. The, the and shelters is the green one and the and the red one. And in the treatment as usual group, uh, same kind of graph with uh, time uh, below and uh, and and the housing condition uh, on the right. Uh, globally, in, uh, in treatment as usual group, uh, people are improving their housing conditions too, but uh, not so much that uh, in, uh, in team reserves, but uh, also with uh, less nights in street and uh, more in uh, housing accommodation. You can see the importance of the green, uh, the green shape. Um, we can also see uh, access to housing in treatment as usual group, but it's much more slowly and uh, to a lesser extent than in housing first group. Uh, let's see a comparison of the two groups for retrospective calendar, and uh, the difference is, uh, is obvious. Is, uh, obvious, obvious. We have a, a very large difference, uh, even if, with uh, other a mixed method and uh, with a difference in slope, like um, 116 and uh, 180. So it's very, very large one. Now you can see our results on quality of life with a comparison of uh, the two groups. We can see a greater improvement in the, in the first six months in housing first group, like in blue and a more continuous improvement in treatment as usual group. Difference uh, was not significant, but we, we have a, a very important gap between dimension of uh, the scale, the score, uh, with uh, autonomy, uh, with six, six, seven points uh, difference, uh, significantly uh, significant between housing force and, uh, and treatment as usual. You can see the, the same pattern for recovery measures, a large gap in the beginning uh, between the blue and the green one, as in first and treatment as usual. Then the gap, the gap gets smaller. The, the use of healthcare service was a main criterion. Uh, here we can see how the number of, uh, of hospital days is decreasing in housing first group in blue. And uh, we see a uh, slightly more complex uh, uh, next <laughs> sorry I made it. Uh, it's a diagram uh, representing costs. So hospital costs are in red, accommodation costs in blue, and judicial costs in orange. Housing first uh, costs are in a plain line, and the uh, treatment as usual costs are in that. Uh, you can see that costs are lower uh, each time for housing first versus treatment as usual from uh, six months. And uh, there's no, not much difference in judicial costs. These savings are reflected in the annualized total cost uh, for housing first in uh, blue there is a very significant drop in cost. Uh, it exists, but less significant in the treatment as usual group. We have less uh, cost in the second year than in the compared with the beginning. And um, if you see the blue one, the additional cost of the program are shown in dark blue. And uh, you can see that even uh, when the program costs are added to the other costs, 
dark blue plus uh, blue, normal blue, the housing force group group costs uh, are less than uh, equipment as usual group. So it's a cost in France. It was a cost saving intervention. Uh, as as Tim said, uh, costs are very contextual, and um, in France we had lots of hospitalization, and um, I, I I don't. Uh, show you the tornado, tornado diagram that we performed and the sensitivity, sensitivity analysis, but uh, the, the 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 cost the cost offset uh, the, uh, the the economy uh, was made on on a psychiatric that is very controversial uh, for friends. But it could work for all uh, all countries uh, that have the same uh, uh, hospitalization uh, level in Europe. To summarize the results of the French uh, as first study, uh, for people with uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder um, in uh, housing cross with ACT, with high, high fidelity to timbers model, uh, I'm I put the, the results of uh, Pascal Secondi um, uh, evaluation of the fidelity. So you can see that it's a very, uh, very high fidelity. And um, this results in uh, a, bit, a greater housing stability, uh, faster improvement of subjective mental health measures, uh, lesser time spent in uh, psychiatric hospitals, and it was a cost saving intervention. We, we, we had uh, conflicting results on addiction with uh, too much missing data. And, um, and uh, we have other concerns with uh, mortality rights, uh, with high mortality rights. Um, like I said, 5% uh, mortality in two years for a population of uh, 40 years old, uh, it's, uh, it's confusing. Three years after inclusion, 94% uh, still housed and 94% uh, still supported by the team. And uh, we asked about the move uh, at, at that time, three years after inclusion, because we were very surprised of the importance of changing flats for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, in only one year, 35% uh, of people change apartments. So it was a real crisis management tool for housing first teams. And uh, we, we uh, as in first instance, demonstrate the uh, high satisfaction rate. And uh, these results have been shared with the government, and the program has been continued, disseminated, and uh, uh, the scaling up is uh, ongoing uh, to for 16 cities. And it is part of the five year homelessness uh, policy plan, which has ever even been called the housing source and homelessness plan. So we can say that the concept has been translated into practice through research and has spread beyond its original scope, which was chronic homelessness with uh, severe mental illness. Because the plan that you can see here uh, is not only aimed at the chronically homeless with psychiatric, with, uh, psychiatric disorder, but it's much broader. Uh, to conclude, I, I can say that uh, the, the randomized control trial was uh, uh, an important factor in dissemination in France, uh, a dissemination of housing first with the timberist uh, model, but also um, housing first in a much broader uh, uh, sense with uh, uh, a change in mind uh, in France uh, uh, since, the, since the trial. So well, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we have some some time for the discussion, but I found it, yeah, it was a very, a very good study. I, I've been looking at Housing First in France for a long time now, but I really, this is a great sort of capture of the results and a very good way uh, to visualize them and to talk about them. And I have some some good questions as well, but I was particularly interested to, to hear you say that moving apartments is something that is a, a crisis management tool for staff because so many t often 
it's seen as a failure when somebody has to move apartments. But I think it's really interesting to look at it in that perspective as this is a way to deal with the situation and, and make it better for both the, the, the tenant as well as the, the support staff, the support team. So I was, I'd never heard about it, thought about it that way, but that's great. Uh, maybe I'll hand it over to, to see if Freik wants to ask a, a kickoff question while um, people are getting their questions ready. Well, thanks, thanks a lot for the two presentations. Really, really uh, interesting. Uh, it took me a while to uh, get adapted to the sort of technical language that goes together with randomized control trials, but uh, I think I'm sort of getting uh, getting it now. Um, the, the, I have both a question for um, uh, for Tim and a, uh, a question for uh, for Eddie. The, the question for Tim is, I have heard you saying in the past, and I use it very often, it's a, it's a really powerful um, um, uh, argument to use in lobbying, um, uh, or the lobbying we do in Europe. Um, in Canada, about 20% of the people fail housing first. And you have always said in the past that you cannot find any common traces of the people that fail. Um, in the presentation you made now, you are a little bit more careful uh, about that. And you say we have to do a little bit more research to understand what makes people fail and if that leads to the possibility to predict uh, if people will fail so that you don't offer them uh, the, the housing first. Well, we use the argument that there was no common traces to say, well, you should scale housing first for everybody that is chronically homeless because you cannot anticipate beforehand um, uh, who fails because policymakers tend to be very attentive to not offering things for people that will not benefit from it. So I'm wondering, like, do you really expect to find common traces with that? Uh, group that fails or can we still use the argument that uh, it's impossible and uh, we should not even try to uh, extract those people that are likely to fail uh, housing uh, housing first and then for Aurelie I don't know if I understood well but could you argue from what you showed uh, uh, especially in relation to the non-housing outcomes of housing first um, that housing first is not so much generating better and other effects, but quicker effects than treatment uh, as usual. Is that the sort of argument we have to make with policymakers to say, well, housing first is not leading to better outcomes, but especially quicker outcomes, or the better outcomes quicker? Um, um, uh, these are my two initial comments uh, or questions, Samara. Yes, I think it's, uh, uh, it's an argument because, uh, you know, with uh, with quality of life and other results, um, like everybody, we, we adapt yourself, you, you adapt your expectation, and um, and perhaps after you 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 are used to be in an apartment and uh, and uh, you reorganize your your the hierarchical way um, priorities. So perhaps the good moment to evaluate the quality of life changes is uh, is. Uh, the not in the in longer time but in in quick in, in in six months but perhaps it's 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 uh, it's it's important to to have that quicker uh, improvement and um i've seen that uh, what what, what it we have the same uh, uh pattern than uh, canadians with uh, quality of life we have the same um, the same shape, and uh, and always as in first is is better, but uh, treatment as usual is uh, is coming just uh, just here, and um, it's not significant, but it's low. It's uh, it's better. So quicker improvement, I think, that's a good result. In fact, even if if uh, it could seem disappointed disappointing but uh, but perhaps it's not with that effect of responsive and uh, also yeah just if i just want to add one thing that because it early made me think that's that's correct the, the quicker results and, and you know we saw it i mentioned that the six-year study done in toronto um the toronto site uh and at that point uh even the people at the moderate level of needs where there was a gap at two years uh, they had caught up on, on quality of life. Um, but it does happen faster. I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Frick. The, the, yeah, we, I mean, we did look at, and, and there is a, a paper on trying to predict, um, 
you know, not being successful um, in, in housing first, or at least, you know, not being able to establish um, stable housing. Um, but it, you know, we, and we went through all the characteristics. I mean, the demographic characteristics, the clinical characteristics, the, you know, we had all that data in, in at home. And of course we had like, um, uh, I mean, there were over 2000 participants. So we were, but it, it predicted such, such a small amount of variability that our conclusion was you, you real, people really need to have a trial. But I think if we back it up, there, there's a there's an even more I think compelling reason. If we in, integrate this approach in a in a right to housing approach, um, we and and the, you know a central value of housing first is choice, is giving people choice, and then if we look at research on you know preferences of people. Uh, who were homeless. I mean, uh, it was a, a, a Swiss researcher, uh, what's his name, Dirk Richter, who, who did a meta-analysis and showed that 85% of people who are homeless um, want regular housing, um, scattered site regular housing, and they want to be able to choose who to live with and so on. To me, that's a really, we probably don't talk about that enough that what do people prefer when it comes to housing? Because that's there, and I, I've been pushing here uh, the governments. We do these pointed time counts every two years, and I, I'm trying to get them to include one or two questions about housing preference, because that should also drive um, uh, you know, what kind of housing we're trying to support people to get into. But, it's very true, and I remember distinctly, even anecdotally, when, when we were doing the At Home Chez Swap project, sitting in on case conferences at the beginning when people were entering the program, and uh, service providers saying, God, I can't, this person's gonna have a lot of trouble. And yet, you know, a year later, they're in the housing and they're really, really doing much better. Uh, and then people who you wouldn't expect to, to not, uh, you know, have trouble, end up having trouble. So it's, it's, a, it's a very tricky issue. Um, but at this point, you know, what we know, you, you, it's, you can't predict it. Uh, the only other thing I'll say about that, and this is important, there's, this has been a, a debate in North America about how do you screen people to match them with the type of services they should be getting. And I mean, typically they talk about housing first being, you know, the, the resource rich service in terms of support. Then there's rapid rehousing, which is shorter term support. Uh, it can be just a matter of months it, and it may or may not include um, a rent supplement. And then there's essentially no support they're, they've been doing screening using a tool here that hasn't been validated, and, and yet it's very popular. I, I don't think it's made its way over to Europe, and, and I would caution you to not put in place these kind of tools because it's extremely difficult to predict. Yeah, we got, we got the same in France. Uh, I I'm totally agree with you. It's impossible to predict good results or bad results in housing trust. Maybe I can ask a follow-up question about the cost effectiveness because I, I guess that's, a, that's an important area um, uh, to, to fully understand. Um, Tim, if I uh, uh, listened carefully to you, uh, it seems that on average, um, and I say it in euro, you need less than 10,000 euro per year um, to solve homelessness through Housing First, extra. Is that a sufficiently low amount in the Canadian context to convince policymakers to bring it to scale? Yeah, certainly the, the economic argument um, is enough. I, I don't think people are, you know, although, it, again, it depends on the region and so on. You know, you, you took, I guess, the, um, the daily rate and, 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 yeah, right, times it and, and so on. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, that's cheaper than even putting people in emergency shelters. Um, so it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. And that's not even costing, you know, what does it do to communities when you don't have people who are homeless, you know, who are visible and, 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 and so on. Um, but it's, it's interesting, the, the, the issue uh, which continues to get talked about it doesn't seem to be enough uh, on its own uh, for governments to scale up, um, mm -hmm. you know, housing first. Um, because the economic argument is there, there there's, there's, there's solid, there's cost offsets. I mean, I, I, I gather in France, uh, orally, that uh, given you, you, you offset the whole cost of the program because of the, the reduction, particularly the reduction in, in hospital days, um, that must have that must have convinced some of the politicians to, to do the, the, the impressive scaling up eh, that you're, you're doing there. Um, so now I will say the the I, you know to be fair to my domestic politicians here. Um, it, it did, once we did the study, the economic argument um, that, that we, when we provided those results was convinced our federal government uh, to put in place. And I, and I think gave the, the whole thing momentum, uh, you know. But I think there's, there's a sense now in, in Canada, uh, and it, I think it may happen, we're waiting for a, th a throne speech here that's coming up, maybe it's next week or the week after, but they're gonna pour a huge amount of money into housing because of COVID. Uh, it, it's, it's not sustainable to have people, you know, trying to isolate them in, in, in hotels and having encampments across the country and so on and winter's coming and so on. So they're gonna, they're gonna try to move very, um, uh, very quickly on that. And I, I suppose, you know, economics, I mean, I'm sure people are talking about that. You know. I'm sure that um, the, um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, could um, make that get that cost even even much greater. In, in Marseille, we have uh, like, um, uh, uh, how, how do you say, uh, mil? And, thousand. And, uh, uh, one thousand, pardon. One thousand of homeless people in hostel, and uh, it's cost. It's really, really. Mm. It's not sustainable, and uh, and it 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 has any any sense. So in that context, I think that a very awful but good opportunity to to make the switch with with, with more housing approach mm. approach approaches in the in a broader sense even larger than Tambourist model. Yes. Tim, you said that there was a tool that we shouldn't use. And of course, there is people in the chat asking, what is this tool that we shouldn't use? I think, I think we should probably not answer it. <laughs> no, it, it. Listen, it's my opinion, uh, you know, and you can talk to practitioners, but I, it, it's, the, um, it's, it's called the, the SPADAT. Um, I, I think it's service priority. Uh, now, Molly Brown has done a, and it's been published, a paper that tried to do some validation work on data. I think she got from a bunch of programs in Michigan um, that's in the Journal of um, Social Distress and Homelessness. Um, and it, 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 you could see it still needs development. Um, but the, the difficulty is there's cutoffs that are used mm -hmm. to determine you know, whether somebody, um, you know, is best suited for, for, for different types of um, um, services. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an assessment of, of acuity, but that, that's the one that, I, but as I said, that's, that's just my opinion, but still, I, and I have no idea if, if it's being used in, the, in Europe at all. Few places I think it is being used, but, but certainly not, not a lot. Maybe I'll just make a, uh, I mean, we're, we're coming up to, we'll probably wrap up in the next sort of 10 minutes or so, but I just wondered if there were any other questions from the participants, uh, feel free to, you know, 
raise your hand in an electronic way and <laughs> or type it into the chat because we, we are looking at that. Um, but yeah, if you raise your hands at, at home or in your office, I can't see you. So you have to <laughs> give us a stronger signal. Maybe if I could ask Aurelie, just, I, just around the desk, mm -hmm. I, I just, um, is it, have you looked at the different um, causes of death uh, in terms of, um, uh, and, and are there differences between the two groups around causes? Uh, I mean, I, the numbers are still small. Um, and of course, somebody could come along and say that, you know, housing first, it's, it produces mortality, um, but I, I, I don't know what you're, I mean, obviously you, you've got that attrition issue that's different between the two groups that, that may play a, a role here. Uh. Yeah, it's possible. We are, we are following the, the uh, after the trail, uh, other people enter in housing trust program and they don't have uh, such mortality rates. So in one side, it's ask the question, are the new participants the same uh, with the same severity uh, as initial participants? Or perhaps we succeed to uh, have a better management of uh, uh, overdoses because uh, the mortality gap was on overdoses. Mm. And um, perhaps with um, uh, more um, reduction approaches and um, uh, recruitment of people uh, more trained in addictology, perhaps it's better now. We don't know why uh, the, the mortality rate of new participants is lower than uh, initial participants. Yeah, but it's uh, an information bias at a certain extent, of course, but perhaps not uh, totally. We don't know. <laughs> Yeah, right. No, that's important. I, I mean, I know we, um, we, we, Stephen Wang is trying to is trying to look at that within the um, the at home chez soi uh, project and, and collect um, um, that data. Um, and I know you know the the just, just the Heritage Foundation, you know, which is a very conservative think tank um, that's tied to the president, I think, but of the United States, or at least maybe advising him. him. But they, they, one of the issues that they raise in a recent paper um, is this issue of deaths uh, within Housing First. Um, and unfortunately, they use data that comes from a study we did in Ottawa on, on working with people with um, Housing First with people with severe addictions. Um, so it's out there, you know, this concern, I think, about if you put people in their own place, and particularly given the, the op opioid crisis, um, there's some issues around um, um, safety that, that possibly are, are not being met. Um, um, so it's just something I guess we need to keep track, we keep tracking in, um, uh, in this area. Yeah, I think it's really important, and uh, perhaps we have to to intervene uh, earlier and uh, to make more prevention. And because we had people like with six years in, in streets and uh, eight years uh, without home. So perhaps uh, uh, we will have lower rates, uh, lower mortality rates if we can um, make people access to housing direct, but not after six years in streets. Well, um, I don't see a lot of questions. I'm surprised. Usually, we have a lot more, uh, a lot more questions. There's a, there's a sort of comment about a linking between um, connecting housing with public health um, and research on quality of life. I mean, I think that that's. I don't know if, if somebody wants to talk about that or if that's sort of a, a statement to say that's what what you're doing. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I could say that the. The, the issue of health, eh, because what's what's happened, at least in in Canada, the um, uh, housing and health uh, tend to be separate ministries um, in um, at, at the provincial level. I mean, they, you know, and so so as a result, 
we don't see the, the, the kind of uh, cross, I, I guess, cross ministerial uh, kind of collaboration that's needed uh, for these kind of programs. And I'll, I'll give you a very concrete example um, in France, and I'm really happy to see that, that you're, you're doing Housing First with ACT teams, you know, assertive community treatment teams, the multidisciplinary teams. Um, the reality is in Canada, even though we tested those in the five cities in the big trial, um, we don't have a lot of Housing First programs with, um, uh, with assertive community treatment teams. The province I'm in has 80 assertive community treatment teams and they're divorced from the 40 plus some housing first programs. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there might be, there might be four now in, in place, or, but no more that have housing first with ACT. Um, so that, that business of trying to link uh, housing and health is so critical. It's not easy to do, you know, because of these, the, the way governments are structured sometimes and who's responsible for what. And the other part, I just wanna mention again, I mentioned that project that Kevin Potty was leading, the primary care physician, and he's gonna be part of our webinar uh, in, at the end of, of September. But that also is, is trying to get people to have a family doctor, because most of them don't have family doctors. They've been getting services uh, through the shelters, through community health centers, but that's not, that's not, you know, that's not a good situation from a, from a health mm -hmm. standpoint. So again, it's trying to bring health uh, into the picture. And I think that's why uh, Kevin's project is, is such an important uh, uh, one. Uh, unfortunately, he was just gonna, you know, kind of get things going uh, literally, his paper came out in the, um, the Canadian Medical Association Journal uh, the second week of March, and the next day, he had all sorts of media lined up to try to get things moving. The next day, the shutdown happened, and of course, yeah. you know, it was all about COVID since, since then. But, but still, uh, you know, so it's, a, it's kind of a delayed kind of um, a project that, that he's continuing with. To, um, to move forward. Well, I, I mean, I'll just say that um, there's, there is one question, but I was gonna just say that, that, I mean, I think COVID is also helping us to link health and other policies in a way that we haven't been doing before. So maybe, maybe that's one of the small, small, small silver linings that we have in this, uh, in this pandemic. But there is a question uh, asking, um, what is, is there one thing that Housing First should include to be successful that is often excluded due to cost saving or to politics? Something that we should pay attention to. Oh, perhaps, uh, perhaps financial, uh, more financial assistance, I responded, because uh, more financial assistance uh, in France, people, they have to pay rent. So in Housing First group, they were poorer than in treatment as usual group. They have less money to life to everyday life so i think it should be very interesting to 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 help more uh and financial and um, the second one is uh, uh actually only people with uh, we are le in legal situation can uh, enter in uh, in housing first so that's the second one that we that we exclude from housing first uh, interventions and uh, for for political reasons. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are, those are, I think I, that makes sense, and I, I agree. I think the um, you know if we move beyond housing first, you know, and I mentioned that in in kind of future research directions, what can we link uh, to to try to give people opportunities? to address social needs. Um, and, you know, and obviously th that IPS is very interesting and I know that's being done in, in different parts of Europe. Um, that could be linked. Um, we have, there's, a, there's an idea too that's been around a little bit and, and I think, I know there's some even in uh, Norway, might be in some of the other countries, this idea of recovery colleges, um, mm -hmm. you know, which are, which are 
they're educational, but they're they're broad educational. Um, yeah. um, and I know um, there's been some work in Toronto to try to do some linking with with Housing First. That again, Vicky Stergiopoulos has has led recovery colleges. Um, and then I think the peer support is important. I, I don't know, uh, Orly, how much that's been. Um, built into your programs. We're, it's still a work in progress here to have peer support workers. Um, but the, the, the difficulty is trying to, is trying to address isolation. Um, you know, as you said, you know, living in poverty still. Um, so what can people do once they've, they've got some safety, they have their own space uh, and they like that um, so that they can fill their, their, their life, their days and so on. Good. Well, I think that's that's all for the questions. So maybe I, I hand over to Freik for some probably more <laughs> questions and maybe some thoughts. <laughs> so, like a few reflections, uh, let's say, to uh, to end the uh, the webinar. I think, um, like, of course, research evidence um, is important. Um, uh, for the fight against homelessness and especially when it concerns housing first that's um, that's unquestionable and the work of the housing first hub is partly related to that we try to follow what research is doing uh, what evidence is new and try to integrate it and feed it into the um, uh, to the to the services and the the, the policy makers i think the Timing is quite good for this kind of events because the European Union is about to launch an EU strategy on homelessness mm. and Housing First will have an important place uh, in there. And I think we have to uh, look very carefully at what we know from research um, to make the right arguments and not to overpromise. Uh, I think in the past we have probably overpromised uh, a little bit uh, on Housing First. And, we, there is certain things that we know for sure, like the impact, the positive impact on housing stability, uh, the positive impact on subjective well-being, uh, the fact that we have to be a bit careful with cost-benefit, uh, that it's very context-dependent, but that you can make uh, that case, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there is things that we can use. There is other things that we have to be careful about. There is things that we don't know yet as well uh, that has, have not been researched, and we just have to be honest about that. So I think Housing First is, um, um, uh, is in the picture at the moment, certainly in Europe. So I think we'll have to be a little bit careful about what we say and research is really uh, important. And I hope that we can stay in close contact with Tim and Aurelie and other researchers to uh, make us aware of, uh, of interesting findings. But if I can make uh, two suggestions for priorities, like things that um, uh, would be useful to have some research about and that we cannot find or too little at the moment. It's about housing first for other target groups than the target groups that are covered in the um, two biggest experiments, the one in Canada and the one uh, in France. Uh, what about uh, housing first for young people? What about housing first for homeless women fleeing domestic violence, etc., etc.? There is a number of groups out there who could benefit from housing first, and I think we find very little evidence to be used uh, to convince policymakers to also uh, include them. Uh, and the other thing is um, when we say Housing First is uh, context dependent. Uh, that's of course true, but I think also Housing First is, a, uh, is an approach in development. Uh, and I think we should also look at, um, like not take Housing First as a, uh, as, as, a, as a final approach, you know, like it can change. There is Absolutely. elements that we can change. Um, uh, Tim mentioned the social supports, the type of social support, but even the three types that we mentioned, uh, uh, critical time intervention, ACT, etc. like there might be other forms of social support, etc. like some research about how we can improve housing first uh, mm -hmm. and the impact of that could be extremely, uh, extremely useful uh, as well. So that's the few reflections to, to, to end the seminar, but I'm sure that the dialogue will continue. I think that's, that's really good. And I think it's important too. yeah, the, the question like, how do we keep improving to, to make sure that the practice and the implementation of Housing First continues to be, uh, you know, of high quality and high standard. And I think through that and through that sort of natural feedback loops, I hope we're able to capture through evaluation what is making it better, what is making it work in some places, maybe better than in other places. And yeah, I think indeed there's a lot of 
of good opportunities now to, to do some specific research that we can use in, uh, in advocacy uh, in Canada too, not just in Europe. So um, yeah. I just wanted to say before I forget that the, um, we've already posted some of the resources, including Tim's paper uh, onto the website at the Housing First Europe Hub. If you go to the latest from the hub, you should be able to find the paper. Um, and I think Aurélie, is your, if your paper is available, we can put it there as well, which would be great. And uh, of course, we will put the, the webinar on um, online uh, in, probably in a, in a, week, a couple of weeks. Um, so I think that would probably be all from, all from us <laughs> at this stage. But uh, I will also suggest that you tune in time zone depending for for Tim's uh, webinar at the end of September, I will definitely be, be tuning in as well. And um, yeah, I think we will definitely look forward to collaborating on future webinars and, uh, and bringing people together. I think it's, yeah, it's a great opportunity to, to really get into some of these detailed things that often when you read them, you have these questions. So it's great to be able to ask them right away and get some answers. So um maybe one more thing to plug i see claire reminding me that we're uh there's a couple of things coming up and we'll maybe advertise it as we go through is that we have um on the first of october to respond a bit to frank's point is we we have the first evaluation from a european um housing first for youth project from scotland and uh so we're doing uh, a webinar on the first of october just after Tim's webinar, to uh, pr talk about the results from the evaluation, to talk about the project itself. So we'll make sure to, to put that out on the website and uh, hopefully you can join us for that. And then probably you know that FAANSA is having a, its policy conference online uh, and registrations are open for that as well. And there's at least a couple of webinars um, sessions on Housing First. So take a look at that. And I believe the research, uh, the European Observatory on Homelessness, their conference is also online and, and that's coming up next week. So uh, if you uh, have a free couple of hours uh, next, I think it's next Friday, Frank, is that correct? Yes, uh, and surprise, surprise, it's about COVID <laughs> and the impact of COVID on homelessness. Yeah. So, Maybe, Samara, to end with one last uh, thought. No? Yeah. Um, um, I think 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we believed that Housing First worked. I think now we know that Housing First works, but it works in a slightly different way than we believed 10 years ago. Well put. <laughs> uh, all right, well, thank you. I want to say a special thank you to... Tim and Aurélie and to Freik uh, for putting the time into coming and doing the presentations and uh, bearing with us, uh, us all with a, with a sort of technical technology that allows this to happen but isn't always uh, worry free. Uh, and a special big thank you to Claire whose magic makes all of this happen. So that's been very helpful. So thank you, Claire. And, and to everybody who, who joined us from a number of time zones and countries and um, I, yeah, I'm I'm just glad to, even if I didn't see your faces, I'm just glad to know you're there because uh, we miss we miss seeing you and, and talking about this uh, um, over coffee and, and coffee breaks and so on. So uh, looking forward to see you again at another webinar and uh, have a very good afternoon. That's great. Thank Bye. Right, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.